the glands in the skin. And there are basically three kinds of glands you would find in the skin. Um, the first one is called the sebaceous gland. The sebaceous gland is the oil producing gland. And it is always associated with a hair follicle. So whenever there's a hair follicle, whether this is a hair follicle on your arm or your scalp, wherever, there is always going to be a sebaceous gland with every single one of these. Even in some of the hair follicles that don't have noticeable hairs, you're still going to have the sebaceous gland. On your forehead, you have a whole bunch of hair follicles. You can see the pores of them. The hairs are very difficult to see because they're so fine and thin and, and almost invisible. Um, but those, even those hair follicles on your forehead are still going to have oil glands associated. Now the oil gland is called sebaceous gland, and it's called sebaceous gland because it produces a chemical called sebum. And sebum is the name of the actual oil that is secreted from these. And I, I mentioned this yesterday, but the oil is responsible for two main jobs. One, it moisturizes the hair and keeps the hair from drying out and cracking and splitting and those kind of things. The other thing the um, oil does is it comes out onto the surface of the skin and, and does the same for the skin. It acts as a moisturizer for the skin. Um, you are aware of this oil as the greasiness that builds up on your face, especially like in the area around the nose and so on, on your foreheads. Um, this is the same oil that makes your hair greasy. Um, at the end of a long day or after a couple of days on a camping trip or something like that. Um, this is also the oil that's related to zits and acne. Bacteria living on the skin, and you don't live in a sterile world, so you have bacteria on your skin. Bacteria can periodically work their way down into these hair follicles and set up residence inside the oil gland where they grow like crazy and form a small infection. Um, that you think of as a zit, all right? That's the oil gland. Another one of the glands is called the eccrine gland. And the eccrine gland is what you think of as the normal sweat gland. This is a gland where the main part of the gland, what we call the fundus of the gland, is located very deep in the dermis, and it has a duct a little passageway that kind of works its way all the way directly to the surface of the skin. It is not connected to a hair follicle. It comes out somewhere else. Guys, can you be quiet, please? The sweat gland here, the eccrine gland, these are found everywhere on the body. They're found on your forehead. They're found all over your scalp. They're found on your ears. They're found down your arms and legs, on the palms of your hands, all over your feet. And they are active from the day you're born. Um, these things will produce sweat all through your life, and this is the sweat you think of as being related directly to um, being overheated. This is the sweat that cools you down. Um, does this sweat stink? No, it, it's just wet. It's a little bit salty when it drips down your forehead into your eyes. You have that burny salt sensation in your eyes. There's a little bit of uric acid in there which is also found in urine, but that's not to say sweat is the same as urine. They have some common ingredients with each other, but overall they're very different. Um, that's the eccrine gland, normal sweat. Apocrine glands, this other one here, apocrine glands are, first of all, not found everywhere in the body, and they're not active for your entire life. Um, apocrine glands are found primarily in the armpits or in the groin. They're associated with the armpit hairs or the pubic hairs, um, and notice that these glands do not go straight to the surface. They come out onto the actual hair follicle. All right, These glands do not start producing anything until early puberty, um, somewhere around fourth or fifth grade. If you visit the elementary classrooms, you'll notice. Um, these are the glands that do, in fact, produce stinky sweat. And when I say stinky sweat, I mean there's two different ways to be stinky sweat. The first way is when this stuff comes out immediately. If you take a, if you take a shower, in fact, they did a study with this years ago where they had a bunch of men shower and put on a brand new clean T-shirt, sleep in the T-shirt without having put on any kind of deodorants or colognes or anything like that, 
and then they gathered up those t-shirts and had women smell them and try and determine what was the most attractive smelling shirt. And the women found the shirts attractive smelling. Now, if the guy went to bed freshly showered, was he like full of BO by morning? No, but the sweat would release certain chemical pheromones that were basically chemical, or uh, what do you call it? Uh, pheromones, they're like sexual attractants, okay? And um, this is what is released from this kind of sweat. Now that's different than body odor. The same sweat that contains the pheromones also contains a nutrient balance that is very, very attractive to certain types of bacteria as well. And when this moisture smears across the undersurfaces of the arm, let's say, a place where the arms are down most of the time, that moisture is allowed to just kind of linger, um, bacteria find that place warm, it's moist, and it's filled with certain nutrients, and the bacteria go crazy on it. And as the bacteria are living their life on the surface of the skin, they are releasing gases. And those gases we refer to as body odor. So the, the smell of this actual sweat is nowhere near as offensive as the smell of the body odor, which comes from the bacteria living in this sweat. Do you get the difference there? Now, deodorants and antiperspirants, how do they work? They're, first of all, they're very different chemicals. A deodorant is something you smear across the surface of the skin, and it's designed to do two things. Number one, and most importantly, it prevents the growth of the bacteria. It's a chemical that the bacteria find inhospitable to their own life, and therefore you don't grow the bacteria and you don't sink. The other thing the deodorants do is they also contain some kind of pleasant smelling something or other. Um, they smell like, I don't know, pick your flavor. Um, yeah. like, Flavor. Okay, pick your scent. Is that a better? Yeah. Like, you shouldn't lick your armpits and taste them. That, that's gross. Um, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to. She told me it was chapstick. Oh, she told you the deodorant was chapstick. Well, that's yucky. That's what friends do. No, her sister. Oh, your oh, gotcha. I thought you did it. Okay, your sister. Well, that's just, yeah. Well, you should have known better. It's a sisters. Everybody knows sisters are evil. Um, deodorants prevent the growth of bacteria. Antiperspirants are supposed to keep you from perspiring. And the way an antiperspirant works is the antiperspirant. First of all, they usually contain a deodorant just in case you do sweat. The other thing the antiperspirants contain is a skin irritant. And when you put on the antiperspirant, the irritant, which is usually aluminum sulfate, soaks down into the pores, into the hair follicle, and it goes right into the duct of the apocrine gland, and it causes irritation, making this area of the skin swell up. And if you swell the skin around a narrow tube, you pinch off the tube, and that prevents the sweat from coming out. This is one of the reasons why antiperspirants can lead to a burning sensation under the arm. Um, in certain brands, people sometimes have to experiment with brands. You try one brand and it doesn't work, you sweat like crazy with it. You try another brand and you don't sweat, but it feels like your armpits are on fire all day. And you, 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 um, So you got to find that balance point for an antiperspirant that, number one, prevents you from sweating like crazy, and number two, doesn't burn. Um, and the reason they burn is because they're just flat out an irritant. Some people sweat excessively. Uh, there's a condition called hyperhidrosis, and they actually end up having to rely on like prescription strength antiperspirants um, that very much burn, uh, leave a burning sensation. Although those people kind of get used to it after a while. Um, anyway, questions about the oil gland. Questions about the eccrine gland. Right here? It said the sweat glands are coiled in tubular. Um, you can see that over here when we look at. By the way, which kind of gland is this in this picture? How do you know? Because it goes straight to. Perfect. If it came out on an air follicle, we know it's eccrine because it goes all the way to the surface. It's eccrine. And this is what they're saying. It's a coiled base. Under a microscope, it's going to look a little different. I'll show you a photograph of that in a second. Questions about either the eccrine or the apocrine type glands? All right. 
Uh, Eckerin glands, check out the density. Eckerin glands over the whole body, depending on the body part, you have somewhere between 150 and 300 of these things per square centimeter. So if a square centimeter is literally that big, you've got at least 150 sweat glands crammed into that. Um, and that's on the less sweaty areas of the body. The more sweaty areas of the body, you're going to have like 300 of them things. A lot of sweat glands. We are extremely efficient at creating sweat. This is, for humans, the primary method by which we cool our bodies down when we're overheated. A lot of other animals pant and use their lungs to get rid of excess heat. Humans rely primarily on sweat. Well, when we, when we can, um, we don't actually call it pant. I mean, the difference between panting and breathing heavy is the purpose for which you're doing it. If you're breathing very, very quickly because your body is just overheated and you're a dog, it's called panting. If you're breathing very, very quickly because you're running a race and you're a human, it's because you just need oxygen and you're breathing oh. fast to get it. So like, what if you were hot and you started panting? Panting? Two things panting? would happen. Number one, it would lower your body temperature a little bit because every time you breathe, you do exhale heat. If you don't believe me, just think about next time you're outside in the cold and you, you breathe on your fingers to warm them up. You know there's heat coming out of your mouth every breath. The other thing that would happen, because you're a human though, is if you start panting on purpose to try and cool down, you're going to actually hyperventilate yourself. You're going to clear your body of too much carbon dioxide, and that changes the chemistry of your blood. Um, it causes your blood to become extra alkaline, and that can actually lead to you passing out and so on, at which point in time your brain will kick in and make you breathe at a more normal pace. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so sweat glands, those are the eccrine glands. You've got gobs of them. Um, Apocrine glands are a little more rare because they're only in a couple areas of the body. Here's what a typical sweat gland looks like under the microscope. doesn't matter if it's apocrine or eccrine. Um, you see distinct rings of cells, usually stratified cuboidal. You can see two rows of cuboidal cells around that lumen. Um, and you see them in little donut rings. All right? That's the typical appearance of a sweat gland. If you look at... Sorry. If you look at a oil-producing gland, they look a little bit more like fat. Um, the difference between this and actual fat are the presence of all these nuclei. If you were to erase these nucleuses from this image, it would look just like fat to me. So it looks like fat with nuclei, and that's kind of appropriate when you consider the fact that these are oil-producing cells, and fat is basically an oil. So there it is. There is a very close similarity between the oil glands and fat tissue, all right? Um, although these are not considered um, connective tissues, they are, in fact, considered epithelial tissues, cuboidal cells making oils. Um, all right. The oil-producing glands, um, as I mentioned, this is going to be something that moisturizes hair and skin and keeps it flexible and so on. And these are also, the oil-producing glands are the ones that become infected with acne. I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. Um, the, the, so the progression of a zit. Um, first of all, bacteria come into the gland, and that can cause the gland to become infected um, and lead to the production of pus which is what becomes the white head on the top of a zit. It's very different than what's going on in a blackhead. Um, blackheads aren't infected pores. What a blackhead is is it's usually a pore that's kind of wide open, typical around the nose area where we have very, very wide pores. And your stratum corneum cells that are constantly sloughing off and mixing with the oil that's being produced by these glands creates kind of a, a paste of dead skin that can pile up in these pores. Why is it so normal? Well, it's, there's two different things here. There's blackheads and whiteheads. The blackheads you see is like the little black yeah, dot yeah, in the pores. The oh, because underneath that, there's going to be a buildup of the oils. Okay? And so, yes, you can, I mean, people squeeze their blackheads sometimes. Sometimes they come oozing out like a little worm with a little blackhead on the end. That's the term blackhead. Um, these aren't necessarily infected, though. 
By the way, have you ever tried these? I've always wanted to do this, and I've had students tell me about it, but I've never tried one. These things that you get from like Clearasil or something, and you like stick them. You put them on your skin, and you hold them there for a while or something. And when you pull them off, they look like little, like all the little things come popping out of your nose and stick to it. They work. I gotta get one of those and try it sometime. Just it kind of hurts when you pull it off. Kind of like ripping a Band-Aid sensation. It's not that bad. <laughs> okay. Um, an actual zit is where there's infection. And the white stuff is is actually pus, which is a mixture of your own dead white blood cells that died doing battle with the bacteria. And it includes quite a bit of the bacteria itself. And there's a big, strong temptation to squeeze zits when they get to a certain size. You can feel the pressure in there, and it's like you have this desire to just relieve the pressure. And sometimes that just involves people, you know, aim for the mirror and, and squirt. And the problem is, is it's very risky. It's great. If you squeeze it and it squirts out onto the mirror, then it's instant relief. This pus has just been ejected from your body. The bacteria went with it. You've cleaned out the pore, and you're on the road to recovery. However, it can actually go quite bad. You can have situations where when you squeeze the zit, it doesn't squirt out the opening of the hair follicle. Instead, it bursts and ruptures and just goes down deeper into the skin, at which point in time you get these gigantic infections. And I had one on my forehead once that I thought was ready for squeezing, and I went, and I felt it burst, but nothing came out. And I was like, oh, no. And the next several, I mean, it felt like it lasted the rest of the semester. I was in college, and I had this thing on my forehead that was huge, and it hurt. Touching it was like, oh, it bring tears to your eyes. And I could feel every heartbeat. I didn't need to, like, hold my wrist to take my pulse. I could count it on my forehead. Like, one, two. I just feel every beat. What? Done a little slice and squeezed it out. You guys seen that YouTube video? On the, oh, that, no, I'm not showing it. It makes me honestly ill. Um, but it's like, yeah, this guy has a big zit on his back, and a girl takes a scalpel and slices it, and she squeezes out like a coffee cup full of pus. And it's like unbelievable. I can't show it in school anyway. There's tons of profanity in the video as they're squeezing this stuff out. And, and it's weird because it's the first time I've ever seen a YouTube video where watching it, I smell a smell and I taste a putrid taste. It's like, how do they do that? It's like, it's so psychologically damaging to me. I can actually taste a bad flavor in my mouth watching the video. For what? Yeah. Oh, yeah, where you get little cysts? Yeah. Um, well, when we say normal acne, there's there's the occasional zit, and then there's the medical condition of acne. Um, and some people are just prone to the acne. My older son needed to be on prescription drugs for acne to keep... You know, he had to be on an antibiotic all the time. He actually still is. He uses prescription creams on his face to try and keep his complexion somewhat clear. If he doesn't use those medications, the acne gets bad enough that it'll actually scar his skin, and he probably has some scars on there from that. And that's just something that affects a certain percentage of people during their teenage years and sometimes into their early 20s, and then it goes away. And that's different than the occasional zit. I never had like full-on acne, but from the time I was 12 to the time I was about 38, I would get the occasion. I still get the occasional zit, but it seems until I was about 38, I always had at least one zit somewhere. It was either my forehead or around my nose. So when you talk about the cystic acne, that's a that's more of a medical type of condition. We can talk about that tomorrow when we do disease day. All right, little poem here. Innocent Elliot Pitts was casually picking his zits. When one he eroded abruptly exploded and blew the four pillow. Blew the four pillow? Blew the poor fellow to bits. Uh, so don't squeeze your zits. It can be very risky. Uh, you can blow up your house and everything. Um, all right, that's it.